بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تمسك بهديه أما بعد فأعطى رحمه الله في ساز من إلى حديث حديث ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لما بعث معاذ رضي الله عنه على اليمن قال إنك تقدم على قوم أهل كتاب فليكن أول ما تدعوهم إليه عبادة الله فإذا عرف الله فأخبرهم أن الله قد فرض عليهم خمس صلوات في يومهم وليلتهم فإذا فعلوا فأخبرهم أن الله فرض عليهم زكاة من أموالهم وترد على فقرائهم فإذا أطاعوا بها فخذ منهم وتوقع كرائم أموال الناس حديث ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بعث معاذا إلى اليمن فقال اتق دعوة المظلوم فإنها ليس بينها وبين الله حجاب These two hadith are under the seventh chapter which is to command the people and join them to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of the acts of the religion, the religious symbols of the religion, the conjunctions of the religion, and also to in, uh, invite and call others to that, as we mentioned in the previous classes. So hadith number 11 is the hadith, the famous hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas, in which the Messenger of Allah والسلام, sent one of his companions to Yemen. And we know that he sent other companions to Yemen as well. But in this narration, it's mentioned that he sent Mu'adh. And he told him that you're going to a place in which they are not mushrikeen. They're not necessarily mushrikeen or predominantly mushrikeen. He says, but they're Ahlul Kitab. In other words, people of previous scriptures. In other words, they were Jews. They were Jews. And when I was in Yemen, I was informed that there are still Jews there to this day and I actually uh, saw some of them so therefore the Jews were in Yemen and the Prophet said, I mean, told his companion that you're going to a people that have some type of knowledge some type of history some type of lineage and pedigree they have some type of information they have doubts about Islam they have things that they're going to throw your way they're not necessarily like ignorant mushrikeen that just sheerly follow their forefathers upon the innovations of shaitan the idol worship idolatry which was made up and innovated so therefore prepare yourself and get ready the knowledge that you already have that Allah has given you that I have taught you but train and get ready to deal with these people huh? sharpen your blade shorten your grip because you're going to a people that aren't like these mushrikeen they're different so the Prophet ﷺ said the very first thing that you need to tell them about and you need to enjoin upon them is that they know Allah. And what's meant by knowing Allah, not saying that they didn't know Allah, but to know Allah as Allah should be known. Allah's oneness. Allah's perfection and beauty. He doesn't have a son. He didn't rest. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He makes no mistakes in choosing and picking His prophets and messengers. And Allah gives the risalah to whoever He wills. Those from uh, the ancestry of Jews, quote-unquote, or Hebrews, quote-unquote, or Israelites, quote-unquote, or those who are Arabs or Arabs, quote-unquote. And we don't want to get into those long, detailed discussions. What is a Hebrew? What is an Israelite? Etc. What is important? People that rejected Muhammad, sallallahu for one reason or another. The Jews who believed in Allah, but had misconceptions and misunderstandings. And disrespect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Christians who know Allah, but had the concept of the Trinity, the concept of rest and tiredness and crucifixion, and the list goes on. And there are other versions of the hadith that state that the very first thing you should call them to is that they worship Allah. And another narration states that they single him out and worship subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, that's the very first thing that you need to call them to. And if they obey you in that, if they listen to that, or after you have established that, then invite them and call them to the other acts of worship, such as five daily prayers and the day and the night. And also the zakah, the tax 
or the tax alms. This is a cat that one must give. And the zakat is taken from the rich and given to the poor. And the poor people of that city, that town, or that locale. The Prophet ﷺ, he then warned his companion, not saying that he would do it, but he warned him and made it extremely clear to him never ever to take the most precious wealth of the people. When you collect the zakat animals, don't take the biggest animal, the fattest animal. Don't take the most precious sheep or goat. Don't take the, 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 uh, the horse or this animal or any other type of animal that's being given zakat. Not necessarily saying that horses are for zakat, but let's, this, this hypothetical example, okay? Don't take the most precious animal that the person owns. Don't take the most valuable type of gold or silver that the person owns. He says, beware of taking the most precious things that they have. Uh, so that's the general explanation of this hadith. Uh, as far as the halal in front of the hadith, then it's very clear. And he told Ma'ad radiallahu anhu to call them to tawheed, to call them to understanding and knowing Allah first and foremost. That's the halal point of the hadith. Uh, as far as the and before we move on, many people they misunderstand this point. And just because you start off with tawheed and you begin with tawheed, that doesn't mean that that's the only aspect of the religion. As some people think. They use proofs and evidences to call to Tawheed first. In other words, that translates the only part of the deen is Tawheed. That's it. And we're not scorning Tawheed or taking away from its importance and saying that it's not important. Nah, that, but then we're never saying that. But we're trying to make a point of extremism and excessiveness and keeping the Muslims ignorant from the mandatory obligations that they have. The mandatory obligations that they have, which all go back to Tawheed, but the people have to know how to make Salah. They have to know how to clean themselves. They must know about marriage, divorce, buying, and selling. The Muslims have to know about what is going on around them. There's lies, no doubt. Okay? We're not calling every single Muslim to be involved in political activism. No, we're not saying that either. But you have to know what's going on around you in the world today. And Islam is a system. It's a whole system. It's a circle. It's not one piece. There's no one single aspect of the religion. Religion is everything. And if you keep Muslims totally ignorant and in the dark of everything, that's not Islam. That's first and foremost. Secondly, secondly is that uh, we find these people who say, okay, just to teach Tawheed. They don't even teach Tawheed. Or just teach Aqidah. They don't really actually teach people Aqidah of Sunnah. Let alone they busy the people with all types of issues and affairs. This person, this innovator. What's your stance on him? What's your stance on that person? What's your stance on him? Have you made tabdi on fulan? Are you associated with fulan? Have you wrote the bayan against fulan? Is that tawheed? Is that aqidah? It surely isn't. So that's contradiction. So we see Muslims who only want to get the Muslims involved in politics. Politics, 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 and more politics. And they keep them away from learning the beneficial things of their deen. And we have other people, other Muslims who say no politics whatsoever. No politics, no political awareness. What happens in Palestine, Saudi Arabia, Yemen has nothing to do with no one else. We don't care. That's their problem. That's what they get. That's what they deserve. If these Muslims get killed, get persecuted, if these people get overthrown, that doesn't bother us. But you must know about Abu Fulan and Fulani. Every single layman Muslim... The revert, the young teenage Muslim sister that's going to high school with her kima open and tight jeans on. The person who barely pray. Everybody must know about this innovator and this sheikh's innovation, the, the tabdi that he made upon him. Even if he isn't an innovator. So, so what scale are you using? Are you going to just teach the people to eat and that's it? Or are you going to teach the people everything that they need to know from the deen based on their levels of understanding? Which of the two? So that's a lot of protect us from contradiction. So therefore, calling to Tawheed first and foremost does not mean nor necessitate that's the only thing that the people learn and the only thing that the people are spoken to about. That's wrong. And we don't want to go too far and too deep, but there are agendas behind that. An average person, unfortunately, the average revert to Islam, or even those who are born Muslim and got, you know, caught up as we were caught up into this yani. Misunderstanding of Islam And of the way of the Salaf al-Salih The average person doesn't have a clue That he's being used and manipulated 
He's being used and manipulated a pawn on the chessboard. He doesn't have a clue. Not he's, He doesn't have a clue of what's going on and what is happening. And how you're pushed away from that which is a benefit for yourself, for your family, for your community, for your city, your country. In the name of this, in the name of that, unfortunately. Whether it's in the Far East, the Middle East, or whether it's in North America. The next benefit we take from this hadith is that it's from the sunnah to send people to make da'wah. Da'wah is from the sunnah. And no one can say that it's not from the sunnah to give da'wah. Also, it's to prepare the du'at, to train them, to get them in the mindset, to get them in full gear. Uh, the next benefit we take from this hadith is the virtue of a tawheed. And the virtue of al-ibadah. The next benefit we take from this hadith is that there are progressive steps in da'wah. The next benefit we take from this hadith is that five salawats are obligatory. And no one can come and say that you don't have to make five salat in a day. And hadith says in their day and in their night, meaning that the times of prayer are spread out. And a person cannot make all five salats at once. As some ignorant people do. That's impermissible. Also, is that zakah is from the religion. And that it is to be taken from the wealthy and given to the poor. And there are many other issues of this hadith, such as, is it permissible to take zakah from one place and give it and spread it in another town or another city? Many other issues that we won't get into right now for lack of time. Hadith number 12, the hadith of Abbas, that the Prophet sent Mu'adh to Yemen. And he told him, and he informed him about being aware of the call of the oppressed, the da'watul mazloom, whereas there's no screen or barrier between it and Allah. In other words, when you oppress someone, as if the du'a is going right up to Allah, and beware, beware. And only Allah knows how many people on a daily basis are oppressed, physically oppressed, economically oppressed. Spiritually oppressed, mentally oppressed, zulm. How much zulm is done in the earth today? It's so sad that there are Muslims who oppress other Muslims and they give them all different names and titles to perfume huh, the funky smell of oppression. So it's not oppression, it's not backbiting. I didn't steal his money, I didn't dishonor this Muslim. I call it this and I call it that. Sheikh Fulan gave me a fatwa. And so on and so on and so forth. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. The Prophet says, Ittaqi da'at al mazlum Beware of the supplication of the oppressed. And the reason why is because nothing stops it from going to Allah, the sublime and the exalted. Chapter number 8. The author, rahimahullah, says, Babu al amri bi qital al nasi hatta yakulu la ilaha Allah, Muhammadun Rasulullah. The 8th chapter is to enjoin or the command to fight the people. Until they say, La ilaha Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah. In other words, from Iman, is that it's obligatory for the Muslims to fight the people and to make Islam the most dominant religion, the supreme religion, the super religion, the superpower in the land. And faith is never put into someone's heart through a sword or through a cannonball. However, kufr is stifled. And suppressed And when kufr is suppressed and stifled Then the people have the ability to listen And to learn and hear and see the beauty of Islam And we've explained that concept In many other classes Such as the classes that we did from the Jami' Of Imam Al-Tirmidhi The Kitab Al-Iman The chapter of Iman from the Jami' of Al-Tirmidhi With regards to the concept of coercion in religion Do Muslims force people to become Muslims? La We've explained that in detail In our classes on the Jami' of Imam At-Tirmidhi. The author he says, Hadith of Abi Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma, Kala Abu Huraira Talama Tufi, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Kana Abu Bakr and Radiallahu anhu, Wakafara and Kafara min al Arabi, Fakala Umar radiallahu anhu, Kafa to Katuna Nasa, Waka Kala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Umur to Anukatila Nasa, Hatta Yakuru Laila Hua, Faman Kala Fakat Asama Mini Mala, who were Nafsa who in Abi Haki he, Wahisabu Allah, Fakala Abu Bakr and Mullah and Katila and the Menfarakabina Salati with Zaka, Fain Zaka to Hakul Mal. Wallahi law manauni iqalan aw anaqan kanu yudunaha 
كان يودونها إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قتلتهم على منعها قال عمر رضي الله عنه فوالله ما هو إلا أن قد شرح الله صدر أبي بكر رضي الله عنه فعرفت أنه الحق The hadith is the famous story of when the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam died. It says here, when Allah's Messenger wasalam, died and Abu Bakr radhi alayhi became the Caliph, some Arabs renegated. That's what it says here in the translation. And it says in between parentheses, converted to disbelief. Now we spoke many times with this translation of Dr. Mohsin Khan, may Allah reward him well. Yani, it's a good translation in general. But there are many, many, many things that need to be done and fixed. Many things that need to be looked over again. In English, uh, grammar, style, and also actual translations of some of the words and the hadiths, the meanings, the concepts. Many things are very inaccurate, confusing, uh, and oftentimes misleading. Uh, we've explained that in many other classes. What is important to save time to summarize things is that there were many people that reverted back to disbelief after the Prophet ﷺ passed away. The Messenger of Allah. And Abu Bakr who was the Khalifa. He was the leader. And it was his view to fight them and to suppress them and to force them back to Islam. And that's it. Not like the Jews and the Christians. Or even someone who apostates from Islam and becomes a Jew and a Christian. An apostate is never to be acknowledged upon his apostasy in the Muslim land, in the Islamic state. Okay, and that's a very long discussion in itself. What is important is that these people were to be fought. Okay, and Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, how can you fight them? And Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa he said, I have been ordered to fight the people until they make the shahada. Until they make the shahada. He says here, until they say, La ilaha illallah. And those who say it, their wealth and their blood and their honor is protected. Unless they do something that violates that. And their reward or their reckoning is with Allah. So Abu Bakr says, Wallahi, those who make a difference between salah and zakah, I'll fight them. In other words, there are other hadiths and other instances which the Prophet ﷺ says, those who say the shahadatain, give this zakah and make the salah, or make the salah and give the zakah as a whole. In other words, you can't split it up. You make the shahadatain, but you refuse to give zakah. You make the salah, but you refuse to give zakah. La. So Abu Bakr says, they must be fought. This, this is not allowed. This cannot happen. So Umar radiallahu anhu, after he objected, Abu Bakr Siddiq, he swore by Allah, he says, if there was one sheep, one goat, that they used to give to Muhammad in the time of Muhammad, he says, I'm fighting them for that. They're going to give it to me as well because it's the rights of Allah, the sublime and the exalted, and teach them a lesson. He says, you can't pick and choose from Islam. So Umar radiallahu anhu says, Wallahi, I saw that Allah had expanded Abu Bakr's chest and I knew it was the truth. And I knew it was the truth. And he agreed with him. So the highlight point from this hadith Or the, it's clear that the chapter heading is succinct with the hadith. And that is, is that there is a command to fight huh? the people until they make this statement, until they submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's laws and his rules. As far as the benefits from the hadith, first and foremost, this shows us the virtue of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And also the virtue of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. The hadith also shows us that a virtuous man and a knowledgeable man could be unaware of some things from the sunnah. As Al-Hafid ibn Hajar rahimahullah explained. And Fathul Bari is that a man could be unaware of certain things from the sunnah. It doesn't mean that he's ignorant. It doesn't mean that he isn't virtuous. It's Umar we're talking about. But there's some things that Abu Bakr knew of that Umar didn't and vice versa. And there's nothing wrong with that. And many people today, they think that if a man doesn't know something, he's ignorant. Or he's weak. Or how could you not notice? And it's impossible. And for then he knows the truth. He knows the haq. Make no excuse for him. You can't say that. You can't say that absolutely. Uh, the next benefit we take from this hadith is the legislation of al-jihad fi sabi'lillah. Al-jihad fi sabi'lillah is from Islam. 
And no Muslim can come and say that there's the jihad is not from Islam. Okay? Al jihad is from the deen of Al Islam. And as we said many times before, and we'll say again, Al jihad fi sabilillah is clear and simple. Killing people, blowing things up, committing suicide, causing chaos and disarray, destroying yourself, destroying others in a haphazard manner, that's not a slam. And that's not jihad fi sabilillah at all. And I don't think there's anyone with common sense. I don't think there's anyone that's fair and objective and impartial that's going to think that those are the same. Anyone who's read anything about Islam, about the Salah, the detailed rules of Salah, the detailed rules of Zakat, the detailed rules of the Janazah, I don't think there's a non-Muslim that's read these things is going to actually think that what some people do, whether they're Muslim or not, is jihad fi sabilillah. Isolated, fighting, blowing something up, causing no type of strategic damage to your enemy, Okay, and just taking one's life recklessly, I don't think no one's going to feel that that's jihad. Okay, in California, or in Boston, or New York City, I don't think no Muslim, or non-Muslim, with any sense, and is right anything about Islam, is going to think that Islam is so detailed when it comes to you praying, but it isn't detailed when it comes to taking your life and taking the life of others. I don't think that makes any sense. And the people who think that jihad is what people do, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, because Allah knows us who does what, and with the people they call quote-unquote terrorism, I don't think that these people actually think that that's Islam. I don't think that they think that that's jihad. As far as the ignorant sheep, huh? the people that are led, the masses that are brainwashed and enslaved by the television and by the internet, then that's a different story perhaps. They believe anything that's on the news. The news can tell them that the sky is purple and they'll believe it. Okay? Social media. But people who have brains, people that are aware, people that have common sense, let alone some type of religious study, they themselves, they know that that's not jihad. And you have those who speak out against it, and you have those who lie to the masses and misinform and say, Islam supports terrorism. Islam is a religion of violence. Islam tells you to behead this person and, and kill this person and stone this woman in the street. That's not Islam. And those people, they know how detailed Islam is and how serious Islam is and the rules of Islam. So may Allah's curse be upon them. The minority of the people who misinform and mislead, the majority of the ignorant people. And everybody's going to have their responsibility on Yom Al-Qiyamah. Those who knew and hid it and those who didn't use their brains and chose to be goat and sheep and chose to be followers of a television screen. Those who chose to throw away their brains for the 6 o'clock news, they're going to have their responsibility on Yom Al-Qiyamah. The next benefit we take from this hadith is that zakat is from the deen. And also salat is from the deen. And that when a person accepts Islam, his blood is sacred, his honor is sacred, and his wealth is sacred. And his true reckoning is only with Allah, the sublime and the exalted. The next benefit we take from this hadith is that the leader or the righteous island, he is to be firm upon his decision. He doesn't allow someone to break his will, to break his decision, to be firm. If he believes it's the truth, if he feels that he's right, and he has to deliver with him, then that's what he should stand firm upon. Not like these weak, simple-minded fools today who have the delil from Kitab and Sunnah, common sense, and they succumb to the view and the opinion of Sheikh Fulan. It's clear. The delil is clear and evident. But I have to follow the advice of Sheikh Fulan. I want to follow the advice of Sheikh Fulan. I know that what Sheikh Fulan is saying about this other scholar is a lie. It's inaccurate. His information is weak. It's misconstrued. He never said that. He never did that. But we still want to follow him. What is this? Idol worship in the Islam. What is this? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he says, I'm standing firm in my position. And that was Umar radiallahu anhu, the man who had divine inspiration from Allah, the man who had so much knowledge, yet still Abu Bakr stood firm upon what he knew, what he believed, what he felt was the truth. And look how Umar radiallahu anhu uh, objected to Abu Bakr because of what he thought was the truth. Allahu Akbar. So this is the true way of the Salaf al-Salih. Not a weak huh, uh, man whose backbone is made out of jelly. Huh? He knows this is the truth. He knows this person. But as soon as these brothers from this website, or this masjid, and these publications, they speak to him. And they run up on him and they threaten him like a mafia. Literally. Literally threaten him. 
We're going to loan shark and racketeer. We're going to huh, blackmail your business. Shut down your books. You're not going to be able to teach. You're not going to be able to sell any books unless you speak ill about Fulan. And unless you talk ill about Fulan. As a brother once said to me, he said, Wallahi Mufti. He says, I know that what they say isn't true. I know you personally. I have no problem with you. He says, but I can't sell your books anymore. I can't sell your tapes because the people, they won't buy it. They boycott my store. I won't make any money. That's what the brother said. Look at this. What type of yellow belly stuff is this? What, you have a spine or you have a stick of butter for a vertebrae? Which one? Just because another man is upset with you and another man is not going to come to your store? Who gives you rizq? Allah or these brothers? Who is in control of the heavens and the universe? Allah or Sheikh Fulan? What is this? This is so upsetting. These people, they actually call themselves followers of the Salaf. They even follow nothing from the Salaf. You follow a modern day scholar and you worship him like an idol. If you think that Sheikh Fulan is right, then you follow Sheikh Fulan. Nothing wrong with that. If you feel that these brothers are correct, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're a blind follower, if you're a sheep, you don't have a brain to think yourself, la bas. But if you know, not think, but if you know that they are wrong, and it's a lie, and it's inaccurate, or if you know there's clear difference among the ulama, and you feel the other side is better, how can you throw away your yaqeen for the next man's threat, forcing you? That's not from the sunnah of the Prophet or the Sahaba. So stand up, be a man, have a backbone, have a backbone. Don't be some punk that the people threaten you and force you and boycott you. And we'll lie, many people may think this is an exaggeration, but this is real. We've seen people today, they were strong. I'm not listening to that. That's a lie. I'm not going with that. And then when they were quote unquote ran down on, when they had a sitting with him and advised him and they threatened him, he turned and changed and switched colors like a chameleon that fast because of them threatening him. If you don't disassociate yourself from this brother, you're not going to be able to do classes in our masjid. If you don't disassociate yourself from this sheikh in Yemen or in Jordan or in Mecca or wherever, you're going to be boycotted. And most people, they say, well, you know what? I know it's wrong, but I don't want to be boycotted. I don't, I don't want my wife not being invited to the iftar. Wallahi, give you true stories where they'll even threaten your wife. They even boycott your wife. They want to invite her to the sister's henna party. This is a real story with these people. So what do you fear? Who do you fear? What means something to you? As for me, Wallahi, I wouldn't care if I was boycotted from a hundred masjids. And a hundred brothers didn't speak to me and made a mean face when they were. I would not lose an ounce of sleep. Wallahi al-Azim. I wouldn't lose an ounce of sleep. I wouldn't stress. I wouldn't get a gray hair or a bald spot. If I was being boycotted because of the haq that I believe in. And if I'm wrong in that haq, then Allah is my reckoner. If I'm wrong. But if I believe that I'm right, if I have ikhlas, sincere. And I feel that what I said is right. And this person is wrong. I have to follow that no matter who goes against. And that is Islam. If Muhammad Sallallahu gave into the pressure of the mushrikeen, where would Islam be today? So it's amazing, amazing how Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala makes the human being and makes the heart and makes the mind. How somebody can just be so soft and so such a punk, such a, a scaredy cat, as we say, so afraid of the boogeyman and the boogie monster. The shakers want to come and get you and bite you in your sleep. What is this? Where's your aqeed? Where's your tawheed? Where's your iman? You're afraid of these men. What can they do to you? They can't do nothing to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control. Moving on to the next hadith. Hadith number 14. The author, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says... حديث أبي هريرة قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أمرت أن أقاتل الناس حتى يقول لا إله الله فمن قال لا إله الله فقد أصم مني نفسه وما له إلا بحقه وحسابه على الله حديث نمبر 14 states that Abu Hurairah رضي الله عنه says I've been ordered to fight the people until they say لا إله الله and those who say لا إله الله then they have protected themselves their wealth uh, from uh, from يعني from being fought and the reckoning is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the hadith is similar to the previous hadith, let alone the narrations that we explained in the jami of a tirmidhi. 
حديث نمبر 15 the author says حديث ابن عمر رضي الله عنهما أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال أمرت الناس حتى يشهدوا أن لا إله الله وأن محمد رسول الله ويقيم الصلاة ويؤتوا الزكاة فإذا فعلوا ذلك عصموا مني دماءهم وموالهم إلا بحق الإسلام وحسابهم على الله the hadith of Ibn Umar is very similar he says I have been ordered to fight the people until they bear witness لا إله الله and محمد رسول الله establish the prayer give the zakat and when they do that their blood their wealth is sacred unless they do something against Islam and their reckoning is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's very similar to the previous narration as well but it specifically mentions the shahada of Muhammad Rasulullah as well and there are many other issues that pertain to the hadith moving on chapter 9 the author says Babu awal al-iman qawlu la ilaha Allah hadithu al-musayyib ibn haznin radiyallahu anhu qala lama hadrat aba talib min al-wafatu jahahu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فوجد عنده أبا جهل بن هشام وعبد الله بن أبي أمية بن المغيرة قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لأبي طالب يا عم قل لا إله إلا الله كلمة نشهد لك بعين الله فقال أبو جهل وعبد الله بن أبي أمية يا أبا طالب أترغب عن ملة عبد المطلب فلم يزل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يعرض عليه ويعودان بتنك المقالة حتى قال أبو طالب آخر ما كلمهم هو على ملة عبد المطلب وأبى أن يقول لا إله الله فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما والله لأستغفرن لك ما لم أنهى عنك فأنزل الله تعالى فيه ما كان للنبي الآية Chapter number 9 says The first thing in belief is to confess and to say لا إله إلا الله In other words, that's the first step of becoming a Muslim And this is an integral part of Iman And that is why that chapter heading is in the Kitab of Al-Iman As far as the Hadith and it states that when Abu Talib became very ill, he became sick, extreme fever, and he was dying. The Messenger of Allah, والسلام, he went to him to visit his uncle. His uncle that was so caring, so kind, so compassionate, so loving. His uncle that sacrificed so much for him. And his uncle wasn't a Muslim. Keep all of that in mind. His uncle would have suffered and starved and was disrespected because of his nephew. And he did not accept Al-Islam. So obviously the Messenger of Allah, he felt some compassion for this man. First and foremost is the natural compassion. And secondly, is all of what he did for him and for the Muslims and for Islam. So it was only right for him to visit his uncle. And perhaps he can help his uncle out. Perhaps he can convince his uncle to accept Islam and to die as a Muslim and not to die as a mushrik. Unfortunately, when the Messenger of Allah والسلام, went to visit his uncle, he found two old stale mushriks, two friends, two close people to his uncle. The first was Abu Jahl, the son of Hisham. And Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah, the son of Al-Mughira. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he says, Oh my uncle, say, La ilaha Allah, please. If you do, I can bear witness. I can testify. I can argue with you on your behalf with Allah. And as if Abu Talib was about to make the statement. But those two mushriks, they says, Listen to the proof of a mushrik. Listen to the reasoning and the logic of a mushrik. He says, أَتَرْغَبُ عَمِلَّةِ عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبِ They didn't say that the shahada was wrong, that Islam was wrong, that Muhammad was a liar. They didn't say none of those things. They said one thing. Look at the whole concept of jahiliyyah. They says, you want something other than the way of your forefathers? The way of, of Abdul Muttalib? Are you doing away with your forefathers? Are you doing away with your ancestors and your, your grandfathers? Look at that. Look at the hujjah of a mushrik. And it's very sad. As we said, there are many Muslims or people who say that they're Muslims who do and say the same exact thing. When you bring a proof in the dalil, common sense, clear reason, they say, you disagree with Sheikh Fulan? You disagree with Imam Fulan? You disagree with the brothers? Even if the delay is clear, but they don't bring a hujjah, they just say the sheer differing with this uh, anointed person, this 
exalted individual, his opinion, his view, what he did, even if it doesn't make no sense, even if it's against the Quran and Sunnah, is sufficient to be used to object the clear proof. And it's very sad. So that's all they had to say to the man. He says, Atargabu an millati Abdul Muttalib. And the Messenger of Allah continued to ask him to make the shahada. And they continue to say the exact thing. And at the end, the man, he died upon the religion of Abdul Muttalib. And he refused to make the shahada. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent out a verse from the Quran and Surah Tawbah, in which Allah, uh, or after the Prophet said, I will seek Allah's forgiveness for you, as long as Allah doesn't tell me that it's unlawful. I will ask Allah to forgive you until Allah tells me not to make that supplication for Allah to forgive you. Allah sent down a verse from Surah Tawbah, it's unbefitting for the Nabi. To seek forgiveness for the mushrikeen, even if they are close relatives. And Allah also mentions about Ibrahim السلام, in the Quran. So the Prophet was forbade from asking Allah to forgive him. And he died upon billah, what he died upon. And we all know what he died upon and the punishment that he will have in the after. So the highlighting proof in the hadith is that the very first thing the Messenger of Allah told him was to make the shahada to bear witness. Uh, and there are many benefits in this hadith Perhaps from the best of them Is the harm of bad company The harm of evil friends And the bad company and bad friends Will keep a person from doing what they need to do So beware of the company that you keep This also goes to show us The staunch bigotry of the people of Jahiliyyah And that the people of Shirk And Jahiliyyah they don't have no knowledge They don't have no proofs and evidences they have forefathers, ancestry. So anytime a person's forefathers or religion of one's forefathers keeps you from the deen, that's a problem. It happens all of the time. You go to some countries, some masjids, you try to teach them about the sunnah, and they say, our forefathers didn't know this, they didn't practice this. Or we're upon the Hanafi madhab. What does that mean? You say Hanafi madhab, and I say yeah, sunnah to Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It's unfortunate. You go to some masjid, you try to bring them what the Prophet did, what the Prophet said, how the Prophet behaved, they say, well, no, we're Afrocentric. Uh, we are Arab, we are, we're Africans, or our forefathers are Africans. And that the black people in America, unlike any other culture, any other people, they've been berated, and they've been disrespected, and they've been raped, and beaten, and hung, or hanged, huh? like no other people that were oppressed in history. And the black people in America were cut off from their culture, cut off from their lineage, from the roots. They've been given slave names, a slave religion, slave pork and foods. Hmm? And they want to be like all other people. Women wear false hair, f- fake hair, wigs and weaves to make their hair longer. Black people want to have lighter skin. And the list goes on. We say, perhaps, maybe what you said, perhaps is true. A lot of it is true. But what does that have to do with the sunnah of the Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No one said that you have to wear the direct clothing of uh, Arab culture. No one said that. If you want to wear African clothes, it's fine. As long as they're in accordance with the sunnah. You can wear whatever you want as long as it's above your ankles. As long as it's not pure silk. As long as it doesn't have an idol or a talisman or an amulet on it. There's nothing wrong with that. You want to eat African foods, that's fine. You want to have an African name, that's fine. As long as it is in the name of shirk and kufr. And the list goes on. Who said that the sunnah of the Nabi Sallallahu and how he prayed and fasted and how he practiced the deen goes against a person's Afrocentric culture? No one said that. So the concept of Jahiliyyah, whether it's Indo-Pak, uh, Indian subcontinent, Hanafi, whether it's Afrocentric type of stuff, or whether it is uh, Arabs themselves Or they want to practice the, 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 What their forefathers did Instead of the sunnah of the nabi Anybody Asian it's no, it's, We're just making examples here Okay On how Jahiliya And a person's ancestry And a person's forefathers Prevents them from following the deen Even if the forefathers were upon Clear falsehood Even if the forefathers were mushriks And kufar Grave worshippers Magicians and sorcerers even if the forefathers didn't know what to do with regards to basic rights of women and children. And the list goes on. 
the concept of jahiliya and how it's one of the strongest tools of the shaitan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to make us of those people uh, and to be those who truly love the Nabi al-Kareem and that's what we do and that's what we say and to die upon al-Islam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.